the top 10 overall stories, the top 10 most important stories to the world in 2010 to 2020. Number 10, Russia's war on the West, and that happened in 2013 and really is continuing to this day. You could argue that it never actually stopped, but the way that Russia has been going around the world, involving themselves in elections, uh, helping out with Syria, allying themselves with Iran, the whole cyber war thing, the uh, going around and trying to create insurgency in other countries to try to disrupt the electoral process, I mean... Russia has its sticky little fingers in everything. And I think that it has definitely been one of the big uh, momentum stories in the 2010s. Number nine, the killing of Osama bin Laden. So Osama bin Laden, the guy responsible for 9-11, winds up meeting his maker, and I have a feeling that that meeting did not go well, in 2011. I think that that's a really big deal, and President Obama deserves credit for giving the order, and what's most important, and I said this for al-Baghdadi as well, the people that deserve the most credit are the troops that carried it out, and the intelligence people that were working on it to make sure we knew where the guy was. That was just a victory for America in general. Number eight, social media censorship. This really kind of started in earnest in 2015 and continues on to this day. We found out that there were companies like Twitter that were saying, no, we're not shadow banning people, where it turns out, oh, yes, they absolutely are. You've also got YouTube that swears they're not shadow banning people, and it turns out that they are. We're seeing censorship uh, sometimes on both sides, primarily on the right. When it comes to Facebook, people like me have been censored, conservatives have been censored, people that didn't deserve it, that it was just kind of a mistake got censored. Social media censorship and how we deal with this new medium is really going to affect our future, and that's part of the reason that it was such an impactful story. Now, another one, I could spend a whole show on this, but I'm just going to say it outright. Uh, it kind of started in 2015, and it's been really going ever since. The rise of populism. And this has led in many ways to the election of President Trump, the election of Boris Johnson over in the UK. There has been a widespread movement across the country. And, and remember, populism is not a political ideology. Populism is merely a method. And it's a method that had kind of largely gone by the wayside up until President Trump and, and other people kind of followed suit. And whether or not Trump was the originator of it or it was just kind of time for something like this to happen, who can say? But the rise of populism has had real-world effects. I mean, you can look at Brexit as a perfect example of this. But what does concern me is that sort of a part of the rise of populism also came the rise of nationalism, which is a is a political ideology and one that is terrifying and based on racism. And that, that's one that I'm really, really trying to stay away from. And I think that a lot of the people that are trying to at least toy with the idea of nationalism do so at their own peril. Now, in 2015, we're, we're staying in 2015 apparently, Obergefeld and its aftermath. The reason that we're seeing everything we are with the trans movement, with the, uh, like the lawsuits with the Christian bakers and everything, it all goes back to Obergefeld. Now, you may recall that conservatives like myself were predicting all of these things and said that they would come to pass if we ever made gay marriage universal and nationally accepted. And we were right. Now we can't even figure out what bathroom we're supposed to use or whether or not men that were born men are allowed to beat up women in women's sports or to take all of the first place trophies in women's track and field. There has been so much, so many unintended consequences that a lot of people, even on the left, are saying, no, we, we didn't want, we, did, we wanted the gay marriage, but we didn't want that. But that's what you got. The reason this is such an important story is because it essentially said we legally recognize that we are the ones that get to decide what marriage is, not God. From the time of our founding onward, marriage was always seen as something that was primarily established by God. Now, there's 
arguments on both sides whether or not we should legally recognize marriage or not. I tend to be more on the let's not legally recognize marriage side. But the point is, even a lot of those people still saw marriage as an institution that was created by God, and he was the one that got to define what it actually was. The Obergefell decision said, no, government decides what marriage is, and we get to define it, and it is this. Our pride and our hubris is going to lead us to a very bad place in that. Number four, and there were so many news stories connected to this one, it would be hard to even scratch the surface. ISIS. Because you'll remember that ISIS really started coming to prominence in 2013. They kind of hit their zenith about 2015. And they started to dwindle around late 2016, really started kind of losing steam in 2017 onward. And this really happened, the rise, uh, they had their origin, I guess, in the rise of Iraqis forces, unfortunately, that were trained and armed by Americans. And Iraq and the, uh, excuse me, Iraq and Syrian forces kind of banded together to create this, what they were attempting to do was create a global caliphate. The Syrian civil war took place where ISIS was victorious. And then, and this is another reason why this was such a big deal, you had the refugee crisis of 2014. This was the biggest refugee crisis since World War II. I mean, Europe was being absolutely flooded with refugees. America took quite a bit as well. And so there were all the implications that came along with that. You had some countries, like I believe it was Sweden, that was one of the most peaceful countries in the world, all of a sudden became one of the highest rate rapes, uh, rape rates, sorry, that's hard to say, of any country in Europe. I mean, that's staggering. So kind of like the Robert Bentley thing in the Alabama list, the reason the ISIS story is so big is not only because of the story in and of itself, but because it also had ripple effects that just created all kinds of scenarios that people had to figure out, okay, how do we deal with this? And even though I wouldn't say that ISIS is something to not even be considered anymore, they have largely been defeated, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we finally got al-Baghdadi in 2019. So hopefully that is not something that is a recurring news story. Number three, the surveillance state. This really took place in 2010 and has continued on ever since. We have legitimate concerns about what's been going on with WikiLeaks and Snowden, and you may also remember this clip of Jake Tapper, who at the time was in charge of the NSA, he was America's top spy, telling Congress that, no, the government's not taking any of your data, they're not collecting data on anybody, when we found out later, no, that was a bald-faced lie, he was lying and perjuring himself directly to Congress. So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. So there was James Clapper, General James Clapper. By the way, that's uh, Robert Mueller in the background, in case you were wondering. <laughs> There's James Clapper saying, no, no, we're not collecting data. Not wittingly. We're not knowingly doing it. We're not collecting data on American citizens. Yeah, it turns out about six months later we found out, mm, yeah, they absolutely are collecting millions and millions of bytes of metadata on us. And by the way, keeping the underlying data, just not using it. They're storing it, which doesn't exactly fill me with confidence, especially after the guy in charge of the NSA was lying to my face about it, about even having that data. And what's really terrifying is when you so see this sort of merger between big tech and the government, and this is what we're seeing, this is the newest part of this ongoing story about the surveillance state, is what we're seeing now is the government kind of collaborating and working together with these big tech companies to create an even scarier and more advanced surveillance state. 
you know, it's interesting that people on the left were always afraid of big corporations and people on the right were always afraid of the government. And while we're still fighting with each other over that, a lot of the big corporations is working with the government to figure out how to control us. Unfortunately, that is the case that we seem to kind of find ourselves in. Number two, the abortion fight renewed. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I already talked about it a little bit in our first list. But up until the New York law, I think that was really the big turning point. You saw a lot of Christians and a lot of churches that had really kind of fallen asleep on the abortion issue. Now, people like me never did just because I'm so involved in politics. It's something that is a ever-present force in my life. But there were an awful lot of Christians that weren't in the news business, that didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to politics, that they were kind of sleepwalking through pretty much everything since the 90s. And then all of a sudden, when the New York law came out, they're like, oh, wow, these people are serious about abortion on demand. And so they finally woke up and said, yeah, this is a fight that we are supposed to have. So it changed a lot of things in a lot of ways for the country. And I am really, really thrilled to see that we are making a lot of inroads. And I think that we are on the cusp. I don't think it'll be much longer. I think my generation will see the end of the barbaric paganistic practice of abortion. And finally, number one, you think, well, what, what could top the number two story, Caleb? Well, it's a story that really, it, it had started a long time ago, but it came to a head in 2016. And that was because Bernie Sanders burst onto the scene. See, the number one story to me about this past decade is they finally took the mask off. Socialists finally quit lying to us and telling us, no, 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 we're just Democrats. We just believe in a, a generous welfare state. And now they're saying, nope, we're socialists. We're full-on Marxists. They may say, oh, well, we're democratic socialists, which is like saying, no, no, we're not ice cream. We're vanilla ice cream. Yet yeah, you're, you're still freaking ice cream. <laughs> I'm not worried about the vanilla part. I'm worried about the ice cream part. Now, I would never... <laughs> it's it's funny, it's socialists don't really have ice cream, but because there's no capitalism to create it. But anyway, um no, the the fact that the political class and the people on the left finally decided, nope, we're not hiding anymore. We're just gonna take off the mask, we're going to straight up tell people we're socialist and we're proud to be socialist, we're not ashamed of it, this is who we are. See, we're finally getting to the point to where we can have a real choice, where people can honestly look at the options and say, all right, do you want this or do you want this? Do you want full-on socialism or do you like capitalism? Do you like free markets? Do you like where we are? Because for the longest time, we were not having an honest debate. We had people that were socialists pretending that they were not and just espousing all of the socialist ideas and all of the socialist policies, but saying, but we're not socialists. We're just Democrats. Well, now they're at least being honest about it. And I like that. Because we can finally have a conversation. Do you want an actual free republic with a free market, or do you want a government to control everything in your life? That's the conversation we should be having. Now, to a great degree, we're still not having it, but at least now the mask is off, and we can use that label, and they can't say that, oh, you know, we're racist. Because remember, it used to be racist to even suggest that Obama was a socialist. I don't know how many times I would say that and say, no, no, you're racist. And now you're looking at the Democrat Party and they're all saying, no, no, we are socialists. We're embracing it. Look at the Democrat field right now. The vast majority of them are either admitting to be socialist or saying that they have socialist ideas. I mean, really, Joe Biden's the only and Michael Bloomberg now that he's got in, even though I would say that he's a socialist, too. But they're the only ones even trying to put any distance between them. And socialism. The rest have just blatantly said, you know what, we're socialist and we're okay with that. I think that that is the biggest news story of the decade. That is the one that is going to have the most impact on America going forward. Oh, hey, what are you still doing here? Video's over. I'm off the clock, so go watch another one of my videos or something. Or better yet, you could subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell, and if you do that, then you'll get a notification when I actually am on the air and you can watch me then.
in the meantime, I'm going to take a nap.